Sebastian, uh, who we've just met. So Dr. Sebastian um, Falcon, so uh, with a PhD in astrophysics, uh, Sebastian has mined some of the world's largest data sets uh, for the last 15 years. Um, he has extensive theoretical knowledge as well as um, a commercial real-life experience in how to fully implement uh, functional machine learning products. Um, so he's going to be talking today uh, in regards to the best technical approaches, um, highlighting any pitfalls to avoid when building a fully functional machine learning product, uh, and also share his insights into tackling business challenges you may face and how you can scale up uh, as quickly as possible to maximise gains. So round of applause again, Sebastian. Hello. Okay. Well, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, well, that's that's blindly. Um, so yeah, that's my presentation. So I'm, I'm Sebastian Foucault, as you mentioned. I have a, a, a background that is uh, not always super typical for business people, but is very typical for data scientists in general. Um, I am currently a co-founder and manage di managing director of a company called Certes, and I will take the opportunity to talk a little bit more about, about it in a second. Um, and what I will try to do today is uh, take it from a real business uh, perspective, the problem of, of machine learning and AI. So uh, AI, definition of AI, to, to, to rebound on what you, are, you just mentioned, it's, it's super vague and complicated. It's a good buzzword and a good envelope word to, to try to sell our stuff currently. So I'm not doing big data anymore, I'm doing AI basically. Five years ago I would have talked a lot about big data. But what is powering that is machine learning and what is making the difference and the impact for the business is how you implement it. So at the end, and it's a bit provocative because I'm sure there are a lot of data scientists in the room, the model you're using has no business impact. No one cares about your model. And what really matters is execution and the implementation. So that's basically the takeaway message for, for today. Um, all right, can I have a, all right, I will do, okay, that's going to be scrolling then, okay, hello, can I go on full view here, yeah, but if I do that, I think it's going to, <laughs> all right, thank you, okay, so that's, that's me, that's just one slide to explain where I'm coming from. I'm a PhD in astrophysics, and I've been running in full career up to the, the professor level, half, uh, half of my career as a professor, actually. Uh, I used to be a cosmologist, so I was working on, on basically predicting uh, the evolution of the universe based on data, based on a lot of data, based on, uh, actually on a very large amount of data. And uh, that's exactly what led me to data science, what we call data science today, is that I had to deal with huge amount of data from the start of my career in astrophysics. Uh, so that's me here, uh, you can't really see very well, but I'm at the top of the 360, so 3 meters 60 in Chile, uh, 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 at 2,800 meters of altitude. I've been traveling quite a lot, uh, living in many different countries, spent half of my career in academia in Asia, actually, I live in Taiwan and China. And I'm in Berlin for uh, now three years, so I decided to, to, leave, uh, to leave academia where I was building uh, uh, data centers and, and basically management solutions for data management solutions for, for astronomers and also building up models based on machine learning there. Uh, decided to live this life and to uh, join the exciting life of business here in, in Berlin. So I actually had the, a short history in, in critic scoring as well. I worked for, for a startup here, Crossland, when I moved uh, from China to, to Berlin. And then for almost more than a Two years, uh, two years and a half, I've been working in the media space, uh, particular classifieds, first for OLX and then for Scout24. And you probably all know Scout24, at least Immobilien Scout, because everyone has an apartment or a house here, so you always, you probably have used that. All right, and uh, since a year now, I'm advising a startup uh, based in Berlin called Certes, um, and I joined uh, very recently actually as one of the co-founders. Uh, what Sotes is doing is basically leveraging the fact that lots of the most clever data scientists that are in the room may think that, well, given the market currently, uh, why not be just a freelancer? And if you look at the job uh, trend globally in data science, 
you know that, or I know at least personally, that it's not very difficult to find a job uh, currently in this space. So lots of, the, or lots of us decided to be freelancer. And what I'm trying to do with Certes is that to help freelancers to find the best project that they, they can find and bridge the gap with the, with the clients and the businesses. So we combined the expertise in computer science and statistics and, and knowledge, uh, domain knowledge of our, of our uh, freelancers uh, to, uh, to uh, provide a solution to, uh, to experts, so the, to a client. So the way it works, in, in one side, we have uh, the client. So we are consulting the clients, discussing with them how to scope the projects, what is their business pain points, and how to transform that into a data science uh, sound project, uh, how they can use machine learning, for instance. On the other hand, we have a network of data scientists that we test. So if you want to join the network as a data scientist, you will have to go through tests, challenges, interviews that we can quantify, basically, I apply my scientific background there, quantify your skill sets, and make sure that we can provide to our clients the most accurate uh, skill set from the data scientist or data scientist to solve their problem. So that's what Certes do. We are currently have a, around 100 people in, a, in a, 100 data scientists in the network, and we are now uh, in a phase where we are approaching lots of people to find them uh, projects. So artificial intelligence, the buzzword is here, um, and actually uh, this is a, a slide that I use usually when I, when I talk to my clients: is that sci-fi? It's not sci-fi. AI is not sci-fi. It's there now, and actually if you do not have uh, some sort of use of it in your company, you're too late. It's just like it's really there everywhere. And you probably know that. You have that in your phone. My, my, uh, you have that in, uh, in your home. You have that in the grid. So the grid power is completely controlled currently by optimization algorithms, which is some sort of, of machine learning and AI. Uh, we all know about self-driving, uh, self-truck driving. There are a couple of companies, very exciting companies here, that are working in the AI assistant uh, domain, for instance, for, for driving. So um, uh, the, the Marvin of, of Iron Man and uh, in healthcare. So there are tons of, of, uh, of solutions that are deployed today that could fall around AI. And uh, for lots of companies, that's really like feels a bit scary, but on the other hand, we know that this technology is getting more and more accessible. Uh, uh, lots of uh, open source solutions exist out there. Uh, lots of very talented data scientists are ready to work and, and can really exploit large data sets. So it's basically, we're assisting at a really democratization of the data technology today. And basically, any company should be able to exploit this technology. And that's what uh, I believe very strongly. Now, you can build product. Um, I'm not sure how really useful a robot chicken could be, right? So you can build AI-based product. That doesn't mean that it's a good idea. You need really to make sure that what you're going to build will have an impact on your business. So AI for AI is never the right way. And you need to use the right data for that, but you need to control your data because for a lot of people, when you open a pipeline and you have tons of data, traffic data coming out of the internet, that really feels like this little girl. You just have no control. How do you drink from a hose? I mean, it's impossible. So it's very important to get the right data and to control it. And it's also uh, primordial to have the right data stack, so the right technology to be able to control this data. So it's really a client pitch here. Yeah? I hope there are business people in, in the room. Um, and to do that also, what you need is us, right? You need to have the data scientists that have really the ability and the knowledge to exploit this data and extract insights out of it and use them to develop the product that will solve your problem and your, and, and, and your basically uh, propose a solution for your, for your company. A data scientist, yes, but typically, and I keep saying the difference between uh, uh, a data scientist and a data scientist with a job is the business acumen. Is if we really want to have an impact and to have uh, what we want to, is to have an impact on the business you are uh, working for, you need to be business driven. You need really to want to have an impact. So this is a, a very common uh, known strip from uh, XCD, where uh, XCDC, whatever, and um, where you have a data scientist that is explaining to his friend that is uh, using this. Uh, he have access to this wonderful data set. He's using it with this wonderful technology and new algorithms that well uh, reinforce deep learning, uh, reinforcement deep learning today, for instance. 
uh, and super fascinating, super excited about it. And his friend is asking, well, what, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, but, but I'm pretty sure we can do something with it. And that's really the type of uh, behavior that will not help and sustain the businesses. So we need, to, as a community, uh, being a data scientist myself, we need to make sure that we provide the right solution, but first we need to make sure that we have an impact on the businesses. All right, the typical pitch around, around the different type of analytics that we have, you're probably all familiar with. So uh, this is the place where we all want to work, prescriptive analytics. That means not only be able to predict what's going to happen, but also be able to implement this prediction into a product that's going to have an impact on your, on your business and on users, for instance. So it's really like going to the doctor. Um, the, if the doctor is coming to, if you go to see the doctor and you're sick, he's going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, you, you're sick, you have this disease. So you're going to die. Yeah, well, I would like maybe to be cured of it, right? So uh, this is really where we really have an impact. And uh, the, this plot is also interesting because typically companies will think that first you need to be doing BI. So if you discuss with, a, with any client, he will tell you, oh, no, but I cannot do anything with machine learning and AI because I cannot even have a proper reporting working in my company, uh, which is a problem, I agree. It's a problem for the company, but that doesn't prevent you to start doing modeling, to start using the data that is there. You have information everywhere in your company, even in sell shit, you can start doing prediction. So it's not a successive that you need to go for that step to that step to that step to have an impact on your business. Usually you want to tackle all this uh, all together at once. So as I said, a bit provocatively, the, the model doesn't matter because what matters is really the execution. Execution is key. So it means that basically if you have the right technology and there's lots of open source available out there, if you have the right talents and there are tons of very clever data scientists out there, then it should work. You should be able to implement products in, in any company that are based on machine learning. Well, um, this is not new. It's very much product development. You need first to focus. If you want it to work, you need to understand what you want to do. You, want to, you need to understand what is the problem you want to solve. You want to go for uh, small steps, so having a very lean approach. Don't try to solve the end problem first. Go step by step and think big. Never lose, basically, a side vision that your company will have or, or your clients want to have. And fail, all right? Try, fail, try, fail. Try, ask your user, do a prototype draw something on the board and go ask to people in the streets if they will buy it. It's really, really the right approach, especially with machine learning. And we have the ability now with the internet, especially in company, media companies, I will give you, of course, practical examples uh, from my, my personal experience of, of this type of development, but we have the ability to have lots of information. We can ask constantly our users on the internet. Even if you have 1% of the user base that will answer to you, that's already enough to make uh, huge progresses. So you need to develop a strategy. You need to basically have a business and data strategy. And that starts with smart data. So actually, I think that I saw in the US, the title of, of one conference was Big Data is Dead. Um, and it's basically the idea is that having a lot of data, that's good. If you have tons of data, that's always a good thing. But what you want is data that is useful. So you really want to have go to smart data. And this is a saying that I like very much is abundance is not wealth. It's not because you have tons of data that you're going to be able to do something with it. You need to have the relevant data to solve your problem. Um, and, um, and anyway, if you store too much data, not everyone is Google, that starts to really cost you a fortune. If you want to store any information that is generated by your user and you put it on AWS, I guarantee you that your bill at the end of the month will explode. So you really have to avoid data gluttony and, and maybe really choose your battle, which data that you want and which data that you need. Um, develop data wisdom, that's also, you all know as data scientists that when you uh, start uh, tackling a problem, you, have, you need to have a good feeling about the data. You need to massage your data, play around with it. So develop this wisdom that I will be able to solve the problem with this particular data set, even before you start it. And then you need to have a strategy. So uh, when you discuss with, uh, with uh, the person that wants to build a product from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the technology that you want to develop, you first want to think business. Business first, what, where is the big box? What, what is really the problem you're trying to solve? And define success. What is the outcome that you're going to get? And finally, um, you want also to iterate on that ac acquisition. Do you, really, do you really have the data that you need for solving this problem? So having the right infrastructure, 
is it uh, Hadoop or is it uh, is it uh, GPU based or is it uh, simply uh, simple uh, AWS stack? Do you want to use EMR? Whatever you always want to have the right data stack for the right problem that you try to solve. It's not because you uh, uh, know how to use Kafka that you have to use it all the time. Similar with Spark, right? So you need to have the right data and also the right metadata. Knowing where your data is coming from, that's something that in any big company you will need to fight for, a data catalog. People will dump data and tell you, well, but I put the data, you should use it. It's just, I have no idea where it is and I have no idea what it is about. Um, and be careful with the data that you have. Of course, garbage in, garbage out. So you need to have high quality data, well flagged, well understood data. One of the biggest problems that we are going to face in the next decades is actually the lack of flagged data. That why Facebook, why Instagram is locking completely access to the data. A few years ago, you were able to access through APIs to the LinkedIn information. Why are they closing all those doors? Because they have gold. They have flagged data. They have the information about what data means. They can predict your behavior because they know what you're doing. So they, they're happy to release technology. Yes, give TensorFlow for free. At the end, what they have is far more precious than technology. They have flagged data, labeled data, which is what we need to build any, any model. Machine learning, supervised machine learning, is actually only based on uh, labeled data. So if you don't have labeled data, you can do shit. And then you get the, the, the famous chart of data mining strategy. You start with the data first, then you clean a lot usually. So uh, that will include also uh, dimension, uh, dimension reductions, uh, feature engineering. Um, if you want to solve a problem with, with, uh, with data, uh, data mining or machine learning, you have two ways, or brute force or brute force. Brute force with your algorithm, with the black box, neural network, deep learning, something that is really powerful or brute force with manpower, the feature engineering, the ability to select the right variables. Then you have the learning part, and then we have tons of different models, and this is not where your battle is. Your battle is here, here, and here, not in the model part. The model part is the easy part. I know, it's sad, it's what we like to do. But it's really, in general, the easy part. And from my, my experience, the, the simplest is the best because it's easier to implement, easier to maintain, easier to scale up. And, well, you iterate. You test, you validate. So you validate offline first. Once you have built your model, you have a training sample, you validate. You go back to the drawing board, usually, and you validate again. And then you test. That means that, basically, you throw it in front of your, of your users and you tell them to give you feedback, and you iterate until you get the solution that you want. All right, so that was pretty theoretical and high level. I'm now going to dig into a couple of uh, proper examples. So there are examples that are coming from my, my own uh, experience uh, in, uh, in the industry. Uh, so the first one is uh, related to uh, the, first, uh, the second company I work with uh, in, in Berlin, OLX, which is a, a classified, it's the uh, I won't be able to say that. eBay Kleinzeiger, is that correct? Of uh, Southern Hemisphere and Eastern Europe, um, OLX. And the problem here is that, uh, um, so OLX have 300,000, 300, no, 300 million monthly active users globally. It's a lot of people using the platform. And it's uh, eBay, so there are people posting ads of things that they want to sell. You want to sell your iPhone, you want to sell your chair, you want to sell your uh, Beamer, for instance, on, on, the, on the place. So they have, in average, every day, two million ads that are posted on the platform. How they do that? Initially, they were having tons of people whose unique job is to look at ads and decide if it's accepted or rejected. Well, that sounds like a very good idea to automate, to automate that as much as possible. And the second example is uh, coming from Scout24, so in particular Immobilian Scout, about a personalized recommendation. You all have familiar with the concept because everyone is using Amazon. Hopefully you use our recommender uh, from Scout24. It's basically uh, uh, providing to the user uh, easier access to the content that he's looking for uh, without knowing it. That's the beauty of personalization and, and machine learning. So I, I will dig a little bit into, into those two cases. Um, and, uh, and we'll see where we get from there. So moderation. 
Well, if you are a provider of service provider in general, there are a couple of things that you want to avoid. You want to avoid illegal content on your, on your platform. That's, that's one. So you don't want to sell weapon. You don't want to sell drug. You don't want to sell babies. Really, you don't want. And that happened. Um, so that's, that's, that, those are real ads on OLX, by the way. And also, you don't want to have uh, people basically trying to uh, sneakily sell uh, uh, Store, steal the data or steal the information of your, of your, of your customers. So you want to prevent fraud. Uh, OLX is, uh, as I said, uh, quite a, a very large base of, of users. There are two million ads posted every day. And typically how it was done, they had this type of centers here, in, mainly in India or Indonesia, where we had people, what they do all day long is being in front of the screen and saying, okay, this is okay, I accept. This is not okay, I reject. This is okay, I accept. And typically, if you do a bit of math, if you have 500 people working 24 hours, they have 30 seconds to make a decision. So here, the problem is not saving costs. It's not because we are employing 500 people. You don't care. It's, we have 30 seconds to make a decision. The amount of mistakes that are making is super high. I mean, this is where AI or machine learning can really help the, your company. So, well, what we did is we used a, a typical uh, um, machine learning based model. We have tons of historical data, so it, it's a typical classification. In this case, it's a, a, it's a XGBoost classifier that has been used. Uh, the idea is, is quite simple. So you have a new ad arriving. You have the model that has been trained on historical data. So the model is basically helping you classifying this new ad if it's accepted or rejected. In 30% of the cases, you put a threshold. When you have a binary classification, you need to take a decision. Let's come back to what uh, Luba was just mentioning. This is the intelligent part. Who is taking the decision? How you set up your threshold in your classifier to know if it's going to be uh, the, the right or the wrong answer. So in 30% of the cases, we are not sure. So we just send it back to the customer support, so the people in front of their screen. And for 70%, we are pretty sure that we took the right decision with the algorithm. But just because we want to be safe, we still dive a 10% back to the customer support. This 10% is actually super important because when you have that, you can send it back to retrain your model because you know what the outcome is, so you can check if your model. So you're basically closing the loop. And it's a self-learning self machine at the end. It's perfect. Um, with that, we now have 70% of I think it increased since I left because they add also, they started adding more complexity in the model. They are starting to use NLP to extract information from the description. They're starting to use images. By the way, a uh, note super interesting when we started working on that project, um, uh, we were not using the description of, of, of the ad. So we were just using what is the classification when it has been posted, uh, if we know the user or not, etc. So a couple of explicit pictures, around 20 of them. And one day, one of the, of the guys in the team told me, well, we want to use the text. So I said, yeah, but to using the text, you know, I'm old fashioned. So you need to run NLP on it and starting to extract flag, et cetera, et cetera. That's a lot of work. We want result now, so we won't do it. And what the guy did is just like passed entirely, well, he, he removed uh, uh, stop words, but passed entirely the text into the classifier itself. And we bumped the accuracy by something like six or seven percent. So basically, the uh, classifier, uh, classical gradient boosting, was just using the past text itself. He learned on his own. It's completely a black box. We don't know what's happening. But that's how powerful this type of technology is. Um, so we just bumped, basically, the, the reliability of the model to, uh, to 95%. That means we are wrong only for the 70% here. We're wrong only 5% of the cases. Uh, and I think it, it reduced still. And for the customer support, they now have, in average, uh, three minutes to take a decision, which is better, and they basically the level of mistakes they are making is lower. What is important here? What is the learning? And what we did wrong at the start? Was this part. At the start, we were just using historical data, build a model, just accepting and rejecting, and then sending it to the customer support. We had no way to retrain our model. So now, every time I'm developing a product for a company, I'm telling you, you know what? Go and discuss with the UI guy. Can you just put a small button to thumbs up or thumb down that we can basically learn directly from our users? Even if a tiny fraction of them is giving us, providing us feedback, then we have labeled data that we can use to retrain the model. 
So ask your user constantly. Always think when you develop a, a model, machine learning based uh, product, always add a feature where you can directly, interactively uh, uh, ask your user feedback. Even few of them are answering, that's super precious to retrain your models. What is in the box here doesn't matter as long as you get this feedback. User experience, you probably have seen that. I, I like it because that's so accurate. The first time I saw the uh, app of AutoScout24, uh, uh, that was really looking like this, just like a filters everywhere. Well, when you took your typical app, Apple product, now you don't even have to do anything. You just look at it, and it's doing everything for you, apparently. Google, you just have one bar, and you type whatever you want, and you get the results. Any company's apps look like something like that, 2,000 filters. Um, when I tried, I tried the, the apps for Autoscope for the first time, um, well, the first thing they were asking me is, what is the make of the car that you want to buy? I have just no idea what is the make. I don't care, actually. I want the car that is big enough that I can put my kid and my dog in it. Right? This is not really user-friendly. So what my machine learning and AI can do, especially in that space, is really move away from that to that. You need to know your customer even before he's asking, you're, he's asking you something. So moving away from... Uh, filter-based decision taken, so the web basically based type of interaction, to something where you actually use on the background information that already your user is providing. Why do you want constantly being asked the same questions by the app that you're using every day? It needs just to know. The app should know this answer. I told you hundreds of times. So be clever. So in that case, what we wanted to do at Scout is to create a, a personalized recommendation engine. Uh, and with the aim to put it on the app. And that means that the, the feed type of, of experience like you have at LinkedIn or, or Facebook on the app is, is super natural. You log in, you've been looking uh, for an apartment for weeks and weeks and weeks. You go and use your app. What you want to see is not a filter. What you want to see is the new latest apartment that you could be interested in, right? So this type of experience. This is basically recommendation engine. And we had two uh, goals for, for this particular recommender. We wanted to broaden the horizon of our users, so we didn't want to go item-based. We didn't want to just tell them, oh, you look for an apartment that's 45 square meters in meter. We propose you all the apartment that's 45 square meters in meter. We wanted to tell them, hmm, have you think about looking at something in Kreuzberg? Maybe actually Kreuzberg would satisfy better your requirements. Or, um, yeah, uh, you put your threshold at, at 500 uh, euros per month, but actually if you put 510, you get 10 times more responses. So all this thing, you wanted to be able to do that. And initially, people were thinking, well, you're going to product, typical product owner that are not data scientists. Well, but we just set uh, rules. So if it's between 500 and 510, we propose 515. All right? Use machine learning. Be clever there. So here it's a, it's a typical uh, uh, collaboratory filtering recommender. Um, so it's like Homer. Um, Homer usually by Duff. And uh, you see a Duff t-shirt, so you're probably going to recommend the Duff t-shirt to Homer. So it's similarity. In our case, we did, uh, so it's my uh, emoji representation of factorization machine here. So you have a user's item, and then you get the, factori the factoriz uh, factorization matrix here. So we use actually factorization ma machine. It's a bit more uh, complex than uh, typical collaborative filtering because we entered also information about the items themselves. And, and, and then we're just starting to uh, implement that at scale uh, at, uh, at scale 24. So this just gives you some examples. So these are items that have been clicked by the person, and these are actually items that is recommended to him. Pretty accurate, pretty good. Same for Autoscout. Cars that has been seen and viewed by the person, cars that has been recommended by, uh, to him uh, that he haven't seen. Pretty good. Now, trick. We have five, less than 5% of our customers that are using both platforms. Guess what? You implement that in your factorization machine, then you can start recommending cars to people that never put a foot on the AutoScout website. This one is pretty cool. I loved it because, of course, there's no rules there. There's no learning. It's just based on the learning of the machine itself. The guy was looking at farmhouses. Well, guess what? We recommended him. Trucks. Pretty accurate, right? It's just based on the few tiny percent of the people that were actually 
looking for trucks and farmhouses at the same time, and we can propagate the information from other uh, base of the users. This is clever. This is really where you uh, have a solution that really makes a difference for your, for your business. So results. Um, we wanted to obviously increase the uh, relevance of the proposition, of the recommendation we are, we are making. So this is typically in media measuring with a click-through rate of uh, CTR uh, or conversion rate. So typically, if you have used your filter, uh, uh, the conversion rate is around 2%. That means that to find an object of interest, you need to see 50 different ads. With our recommender, you drop that by to 12. So you need only 12 ads to see something that is interesting, which is already pretty good. But the most interesting part is not there. The most interesting part is there. So we did some simulations. We obviously have historical data, so we could simulate what will have been recommended to people historically, according to our, our uh, uh, recommender. And we could compare to what they actually have seen and looked for. And what we realize is that in, uh, for 70% uh, of the cases, the thing that we recommended to the person, he will never have found him on his own, using his way of searching, uh, using his filter sets, etc. So basically, only 30% of the lead, uh, generating recommended properties were a common to something that this person will have anyway found on his own. Well, think about that. What, what basically you're doing here is picking up the brain of the other people. Why? Because why you recommend some 70% 70, 70 of things that the other person haven't seen is just because I have a way of looking for something, they have a completely different pattern. So he was going to use different filters, going to say, oh yeah, well, uh, actually I don't really care about the square meter, so I will, I'm going to, to broaden a bit the filter. I never think about that because I want 45 square meters. But me, I will start playing around with the neighborhoods, for instance. So we all have our different patterns, and what the machine here is doing is basically leveraging this. It's basically combining all our brains together. Uh, I found it pretty interesting. Uh, learning from this, uh, the implementation has been very, very complicated. We had lots of limitations, stones of data. Um, and uh, the good thing that we did is that we basically developed on the fly the architecture that we had behind it. Uh, uh, the reason why it's complicated, because in a normal setting, your data is not in your super data lake that you dream of. Your data is split, so you have user data there, then actually you have some data that is relevant that is another complete database, and you need to, to query, merge queries, you need to go for history to build that. So we had three weeks of history in the past to retrain the recommender offline. So all this architecture, we have developed it on the fly. And uh, that was somehow a blessing because we adapted to what we needed. If we had, uh, like it is today at Scout, now we have a, a bit more setup uh, architecture that is quite standard, we probably have struggled far more doing it because we don't have this liberty anymore. So sometimes not putting too much structure in your architecture for, for your solution is, is a blessing in these guys. All right, that's it. So I'm Sébastien Foucault, and I'm the Managing Director of Certes. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Sebastian. Uh, very interesting and, uh, yeah, very complex. Well, I found it complex, but interesting. Um, again, throw out to the floor any questions.